During an exclusive interview with the RISE business correspondent, Ritu Sodiri, on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, the governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa, Letseya Hanyahu, praised the Afrexim Bank's Pan-African payment settlement system, but said liquidity to boost Pan-African trade rest with central banks. We have been asked by the heads of states to, to work together with Afrexim Bank as the uh, central banks. The, there are all sorts of configurations uh, in between uh, because part of it is that uh, we have got uh, payment systems that are currently working and we want them to be interoperable. So you could have them being interoperable or you could try and create something that uh, starts everything from, uh, from scratch. But what is crucial is that payment systems are the responsibilities of central banks and there is a reason why they are responsibilities uh, of central banks. So if in that payments intercontinental payment system we run out of Naira. We know who to talk to. We have got to speak to the Central Bank of Nigeria. And uh, if the Central Bank of Nigeria is not in there, who will provide the Naira? And the reason why any of the payment systems that would interconnect the continent have got to have central banks to uh, underpin it is that central banks are the ones that provide liquidity. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, speaking of central banks, I want to get on monetary policy matters in South Africa. We've seen inflation decelerate, I think, from 5.9% in October to 55 in November. Are you seeing a further deceleration in December? And then does that mean, because the markets are expecting or forecasting that you might be cutting rates um, this year at your next meeting, what's your, what can you telegraph for us based on your inflation read? I, I like wh where you start. Uh, and I think this should be a lesson for many a commentator. Uh, that uh, the point of departure should be where is the inflation before we talk about the rates. Many of them go head first uh, with uh, uh, interest rates and uh, kudos uh, uh, to you for that. Thank you. And so, so, so you, 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 you saw the figure of deceleration from 5.9 to 5.5, but you've got to look what has happened throughout the year. And the truth is that throughout the year, inflation was declining at a very pedestrian uh, pace. And it was only in uh, um, uh, July, August about that inflation declined to 4.7 and then started to tick up again to 4.8. And then it goes to 5.9 and now it's only declining to 5.5. So we must be careful that you just don't take two data points being the 5.9 and the 5.5 because there is this horizon that we have got to look, uh, uh, to look at. But you, it's well spotted. Point though is that today's inflation, yesterday's inflation mean nothing about where policy is going in the future. Today's inflation that came out is telling us what policy that was determined 12 months ago has actually achieved. So to figure out what is going to be happening with policy going forward into the future, we have got to say what is the inflation trajectory looking like and based on that inflation trajectory, then try and recalibrate policy accordingly. And so and we forecast that inflation outcome for last year average will be 5.8. We this year we are forecasting 5% and next year 4.5%. For us to start making an adjustments on the policy rate, we need to see that inflation has declined uh, and is sustained at the uh, at our target uh, level. And our target here is in the midpoint of our inflation target range, which is 4.5%. And we would look at inflation declining to 4.5% and being sustained. And then on a forward-looking basis, that would it stay there? And if we believe it would stay there, and after we have assessed the balance of risks, then we can uh, take a view. Is a restrictive monetary policy stance still appropriate? And if we believe that it is no longer appropriate, given the inflation outlook on a 12 to 18 months horizon, then it will give us scope to reconsider the monetary policy stance. Fantastic. Um, on the global front, I'm wondering if you're keeping an eye on what's happening um, in the Red Sea and um, the U.S. allied forces attacking Houthi rebels and what that impact could have on trade in terms of the international shipping vessels and if there's an inflationary impact from there. Uh, too early to tell, but it could be uh, because um, the shipping lines um, would have to make adjustments given the security risks uh, in the area. Insurers might reconsider the pricing of the risks. And those shipping lines might be forced to pass those uh, 
uh, costs to their customers. And if their customers are supplying us in the public, those suppliers might pass this uh, to the uh, public. So there would be uh, that implications in terms of uh, the pricing. But to the extent that some of the shipping lines might actually even decide either to scale back or something, it could lead to problems in the global supply chains to the extent that it affects goods uh, that are coming from that uh, uh, region or going into that uh, going into that region and uh, um, uh, that could be problematic exactly how much that means is a different matter there is of course uh, the shipping lines might not do that they might decide they are not going through the um, the Red Sea uh, anymore which is exactly why the Portuguese explorers went around uh, the Cape and it might mean that the shipping lines go around the Cape because it is safer but it is longer to go to Europe than to go through the Red Sea and that too might be uh, uh, might be cost raising mm -hmm. uh, but um, th so that is how we would uh, uh, we would think uh, we would think about it and so you will find that globally central banks are raising the issue of the impact of the geopolitical tensions uh, on the global economy and on the uh, price formations uh, uh, global. So it is not just the attacks in the Red Sea, is the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, is the uh, Israeli-Palestine uh, Hamas uh, conflict. All of those things have got an impact uh, to uh, on uh, the uh, risks to. Uh, the economic outlook. Thank you for that, sir. Um, on the fiscal side of things in South Africa, I know it's an election year. Um, I wanted to know if you have you any concerns about the public finances of, of the nation. Well, we leave a public finance uh, with the Treasury, uh, uh, and they have returned the favor because they don't comment about monetary uh, policy. We do take into account the fiscal stance in our. Uh, deliberations. Why do we do that? One of the things that determines whether our monetary policy stance is restrictive or accommodative is that we have got to uh, know what the neutral uh, real interest rate is and that neutral real interest rate uh, uh, tells us is the rate at which monetary policy is neither accommodative nor uh, restrictive. And so a uh, if a big component of that neutral real interest rate is actually what we call the country risk premium. So the country risk premium is driven by the state of public finances uh, in the country. And if there is a belief that this is a country that is managing its public finances well and that it can be able to contain its debt and all of that, the country risk premium comes down. And if the country risk premium comes down, the neutral real interest rate comes down and it tells us whether monetary policy is more accommodative or whether it is more restrictive. And you would then be made to adjust the policy rate to be consistent with the changed uh, neutral rate. So. We had repeatedly said that South Africa would benefit from a prudent macroeconomic framework and a prudent, in particular, a prudent fiscal stance. And the Treasury had pronounced that they would like to embark on a fiscal path that uh, restores the sustainability of the South African um, uh, public uh, finances, or let, rather put uh, differently, uh, put a path that would enable South Africa not to be seen to be in a fiscal stress. In other words, putting us on a more solid fiscal footing. Fantastic. Uh, finally, sir, I mean, you were appointed in November of 2014. You were reappointed to another five-year term in November of 2019. That comes to an end this year. Would you serve again if um, you were called upon by, by, by the new president after this election? Well, um, we do not appoint ourselves. Uh, we got appointed uh, by the president. Um, I have been, by August this year, I would have been in the South African public service for 30 years. And I have always been a servant of uh, my people. Uh, I, I don't know anything else other than saving people. And um, if for whatever reason uh, um, the appointing authority says, thank you very much for a job well done, I will take that batch of honor and walk tall with the knowledge that I served my people to the best of my uh, ability. Uh, but um, I would be able to serve South Africans in 
uh, other rules uh, if need be. Uh, but let's not speculate. The appointing authority might say, hey, uh, we think that you must stick around. And if that happens, uh, I will apply my mind. I will engage in conversations with the appointing authority and make an, uh, an appropriate uh, a, a decision. I think what is uh, important here is that um, I would say that with my colleagues, we built an institution in the South African Reserve, we built an institution that will outlive the legacy of uh, any individual. And I think that the institution is on a very solid footing. It has got a very good standing in South African society. It has got a very good uh, standing uh, globally. And thanks to the good men and women uh, in the South African Reserve Bank, whether it is me at the helm or is somebody else, we have got a solid central bank in South Africa.